This is going to be Psalm 26, and I want to talk about five ways to prevent backsliding. Now, backsliding doesn't mean you just got off into some deep, dark sin. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It could be that you just stopped doing a lot of the good things that you were doing, or the good things that you were doing slowed down a lot, and it's beginning to just decrease with time to the point where it'll not be there anymore eventually if it continues to decrease. And I just want to give you some tips on five ways to prevent backsliding. Now in this psalm, it's a psalm of David, and what you have is David appealing to his own self-righteousness to get a prayer answered. He's, he's coming to God and talking about his own self-righteousness to get a prayer answered. Now, me and you today, we don't do that. You know, I mean, I don't feel confident enough to do that. But the first thing I want to say is, in your mind, you need to consider sliding shouldn't be an option. Backsliding shouldn't be an option. In Psalm 26, 1, it says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. When you are faced with good and evil, light and darkness, the broad way and the narrow way, God and the devil, all of those bad things you're faith, faced with shouldn't even be seen as an option. Your attitude should be like, I'm right with the Lord, so fornicating isn't an option. Adultery isn't an option. Drinking isn't an option. Gossiping about my brother in Christ isn't an option. Slacking in my Bible reading isn't an option. Did you know if you never gossip once that you can't ever backslide because of your gossiping? If you um, don't ever decrease in your Bible study or your time spent in the Bible, try to increase it and you'll never backslide in that way. Your flesh is still sinful, but if you, if you see sinning and sliding back, sliding backwards, if you see those things as not an option, then you won't contemplate doing it in your mind so much. If you see the things that your flesh wants, the sinful things your flesh wants, if you just start looking at those things as they're not an option, then you're not going to just contemplate them doing them things in your mind all day. Like me and my wife have always said, divorce isn't an option. I mean, we could get a divorce. I mean, it's, it's something that people do every day. But if we ever fought or got into an argument, a divorce wouldn't be an option. Sure, we could get one, but we never made it an option. So therefore, it's, it's never happened. It's never come up. We've never even been close to it. Now, number two, stretch yourself on God's operating table. The first thing was sliding shouldn't be an option. Don't make it an option in your mind to go backwards. Continuously think about going forwards. And the second thing, stretch yourself out on God's operating table or His examining table. You're going to have to constantly be examining yourself. Stretch yourself out on the Lord's table and let Him find anything in your life that is sinful and wrong. David said in Psalm 26, 1, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore I shall not slide. David said, Judge me, O Lord. I've never been confident enough to say this like David says it. But, open up your Bible and read it, and tell the Lord to show you what is wrong in your life. In 1 Corinthians 11.31, it says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Well, David says, Judge me, O Lord. Uh, I want to judge myself first and plead with God. When I mess up, I go straight to the Lord and tell Him that I was wrong. Tell Him I shouldn't have done what I did and that I'm sorry. Judge yourself and it will be a lot easier on you. I mean, you want to judge yourself first before you go to the Lord and say, Judge me, O Lord. Stretch yourself out on the table and let Him expose anything you have that is wrong in your life and think about everything you do from the time you get up until the time you go to bed. Is it all godly? David says in Psalm 26, 2, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart. He said, Examine me. Let the Lord give you a good spiritual, physical. 
Let him prove you. David is confident that he has been walking in the Lord, walking in truth. He is asking the Lord to prove him. He wants it proven that he's living right. Like when you get a physical fitness test. You worked out and you tried to live healthy and eat healthy, and then the test comes. You are confident that you will ace it. David is confident that he's been walking with the Lord, so he says, Judge me, O Lord. Try me. Prove me. Try my reins in my heart. In Psalm 26, 3, For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. Notice that it isn't just the fear of chastening and the fear of God's judgment that kept David living right and walking in truth. But he said, For thy loving kindness is ever before mine eyes. So, Focusing on the Lord's loving kindness, that helps me. The fact that the Lord cares about me makes me want to stay in fellowship with him. The fact that he could chasten me if I get out of line makes me want to stay in fellowship with him. David said, For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. Notice that David is very, very confident in how he walked and how he was living. So, number one. Make sure that sliding isn't even an option. Backsliding. Don't even let that be an option. Always strive to go forward and increase. Number two, stretch yourself on God's operating table. Let Him examine you. Let Him open you up with the Word of God and let the Word of God expose everything that's wrong about you. Number three, sit with the household of faith. If you don't follow foolish people, then you will be less likely to do foolish things. If you don't get with the wrong crowd, then you're going to be less likely to go back doing those wrong things. I know a lot of people that quit doing drugs. They tell me that they're clean and sober, yet they still hang out with people who do drugs, so they get back on drugs. It's like if a habitual fornicator that tries to quit fornicating but keeps hanging around strip clubs and prostitutes, he's going to have a hard time not fornicating. David says in verse 4, I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. So look at that. He's not sat with vain persons. He won't go in with dissemblers. He hates the congregation of evildoers and he won't sit with the wicked. What if you had a ruler like that today? What if David was your king? What if you had a president that wouldn't even sit with workers of iniquity? What if you had a president that wouldn't sit with men that love to abort babies and traffic children and drink alcohol and cuss like a sailor? What if you had a king like that? One day you will have a king sitting on a physical throne that doesn't put up with any of that junk, and that is Jesus Christ the righteous. You don't have that today. And I mean, your life's pretty good. Imagine how, life, how good your life's going to be when Jesus Christ is on the throne, if you love righteousness. If you love righteousness... You're going to love the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. But David, a perfect type of Jesus Christ, wouldn't sit with all that nonsense. He wouldn't sit with the wicked. He wanted to be around other saints of God. He wanted to sit with the household of faith. It is a lot easier for a bum on the street to pull you down on the street with him than it is for you to pull him up off the street. And David knows that. He's not going to hang around with all these people who are just going to pull him down. Now, I'm not saying you can't witness to them. I'm not saying you can't be friendly to that person or be a helping hand. I'm just saying you can't go out to the bar with your friends that are lost and expect to not backslide. In Psalm 26, 8, David said, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. That's not the congregation of evildoers. David loved the habitation of the Lord's house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. I want to hang around a place where there's people who love God and honor God. I don't, I don't see how you can just sit and watch TV shows like Family Guy that make fun of Jesus Christ in the Bible. I hate the congregation of evildoers. I hate that show. That is what the cast of that show is, a congregation of evildoers getting together to make money off of making fun of Jesus. The same thing goes for American Dad and Saturday Night Live 
and pretty much anything on TV loves to make fun of Jesus Christ. That is the Congregation of Evil Doers. Award shows, Congregation of Evil Doers. I hate that junk. I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Those things don't honor God. God's honor doesn't dwell there. I fit in with Christians. I like to be around other people who love the King James Bible, men who hate the things of this world, men who think this world is an absolute mess and it's not their home. That's who I like being around. 1 John 3, 14, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. We know. I mean, it's a good, it's a good sign that you're saved when you love being around other Christians. Now, I'm not saying you won't get to a point where you don't like being around them because some of them are hard to be around. But if you find the right type of Christian, then you're going to love being around them. And Psalm 26, 9, Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. You don't want to gather with bloody men. You want to sit with the household of faith. I mean, the bloody men, they're in danger of death and judgment every step they take. I don't even want to be around them. It says in Psalm fifty five twenty three, But thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. Do you know where sinners are gathered in, in the end? Hellfire. In Matthew thirteen thirty, it says, Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. They're going to be gathered and burned. And David says in verse 9, Gather not my soul with sinners nor my life with bloody men. Notice the line that God makes between saints and sinners. In the Old Testament, the word sinners is used for extremely wicked people. I mean, David is a sinner too, but he, he's not classified as one. You, you're going to see that in most cases in the Old Testament, sinners, the word sinners is used for extremely wicked people, whereas in the New Testament... Specifically, Paul uses the word differently. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you get saved, then in the eyes of God and in eternity, and when, it, when you consider eternity, you are no longer considered a sinner if you're saved, if you're born again. You are a saint, you are a child of God, and you're righteous as Jesus Christ. But when it comes to your flesh, it's sinful. But David... When he uses that word sinners, he's referring to extremely wicked people. David doesn't want to be gathered with sinners. He doesn't want to be congregating with evildoers. He doesn't want to be a part of the Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, the Bohemian Grove, or the Democrats, or the Republicans. He doesn't order from Pizzagate. He warns about these people. He says in verse 10, whose hands, In whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. Their hands are mischievous. Elimus, the sorcerer in Acts 13, was full of all subtlety and mischief, and Paul called him a child of the devil. What we have running this country and in high up places in this country and in places of popularity are children of hell. They go to bed at night scheming. They're plotting on how they can make this place a place of wickedness. And to them, this is progress. They think they're making progress. They think they're bringing on the next phase of evolution or something. But they're mischievous. And in Proverbs 6.18, feet that be swift and running to mischief is one of the things that the Lord says he hates. God hates the hands and feet that go to mischief. That junk was going back on in David's day, just like it's going on today. But David didn't want to sit with the wicked. If David was here today, he would not be in fellowship with the people that's in charge of this country. He doesn't want, he didn't want mischievous hands around him. He says in uh, Psalm 26, 6, I will wash mine hands in innocence, innocency. So will I come past thine altar, O Lord. So some things not to backslide. What are some things not to backslide? Consider sliding as not an option. Sliding shouldn't be an option. It shouldn't even be an option to you to backslide or to go back. 
Just can focus on increasing. Next thing, stretch yourself out on God's examining table. The next thing, sit with the household of faith. Now David says, I will wash my hands in innocency. In verse 6, so the next thing is soak your hands in truth. Let your hands be folded in prayer, thumbing through the scriptures, being a helping hand, waving and showing yourself friendly, working with your hands to provide for your family. Soak your hands in truth. Soak your hands in work. Good works. You see, my political views is don't hurt people. Leave people alone. Go to work. Leave me alone. If people did that, we would be a lot better off. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want people to hurt me. I just, I want to leave people alone and I want them to leave me alone. In the sense, I don't want somebody trying to make me do things that I shouldn't have to do and that I don't want to do. And I don't want to come up to somebody else and make them do things they don't want to do. I mean, I have no desire to do that. I want people to be free and be able to do what they want to. And as long as it's, you know... As long as they're not hurting other people and doing things that are just completely wrong, they should be able to do those things, even if I don't necessarily agree with it. Like, I don't agree with views of, of all religions, but that doesn't mean I'm, I should try to stop them from doing their religion because then they'll try to stop me from doing mine. They'll try to stop me from being a Bible believer. But if you soak your hands in truth from the time you get up until the time you go to bed, then you aren't going to get into mischief. And David said in Psalm twenty six eleven, But as for me, I will walk in my integrity, redeem me, and be merciful unto me. David says he walks in truth. He walks in his integrity. His feet aren't swift in running to mischief. He wasn't constantly scheming about how he could get more power and more stuff he washed his hands in innocency. He made sure that he was innocent of all that corruption that was going on. And it reminds you of what Pilate did in the New Testament. He says, I've washed my hands of the blood of this just person. Of course, we know that he wasn't innocent like David. He just thought that he was. But David says, I will wash my hands in innocency. He says, redeem me. I've been redeemed. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is that man that has the blood of a just person. He has innocent blood. His betrayer, Judas, said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Jesus is innocent. David says, be merciful unto me. These things David is saying shows that he knows he needs God's grace and he needs his mercy and he needed to soak his hands in innocency. And the only true innocent hands that a man ever had has holes in them right now. Jesus Christ has the only true innocent hands, and they got holes in them. In Revelation 1-7, it talks about how it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. In Psalm 26, 12, my foot standeth in an even place. In the congregations will I bless the Lord. David was walking around in the congregations where he could bless the Lord. He loved being in the habitation of the Lord's house where the Lord's honor dwelt, where he could bless the Lord. And in Psalm 103, 1 through 3, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. David wanted to bless the Lord. That's completely different than, than what you see with the wicked rulers of the world today. He said, I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. Now the last thing, if you're going to prevent backsliding, speak of the Lord constantly. If you're always talking about the Lord and having Him on your mind in every situation, then you're not going to backslide. Just like a woman who constantly talks about her husband in a good way, most likely she's not going to cheat on him. I mean, if you're uh, struggling with men flirting with you at work, go to work talking good about your husband and carry a Bible. They'll stop flirting with you or at least decrease it. 
But David says in Psalm 26, 7, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. David spoke of the Lord constantly. If you do that, that's going to prevent backsliding. He said, I will tell of all thy wondrous works. Wondrous works. I've been to a place called Wonder Works. You know, the upside building attraction thing that I think they got at Myrtle Beach. I've been to the one in Pigeon Forge. It couldn't compare to the works of God. David would go around and speak of the wondrous works of God. The works that men come up with aren't so wondrous. They're kind of cool sometimes, but they're nothing really that's going to make you think about them tomorrow. But David, he spoke of the wondrous works of God and published his thanksgiving for the Lord. If you go into work holding a Bible and talking about the Lord, then the evildoers will go the other way most times. And the evildoers, if they have any respect at all, might even clean up their mouth a little bit around you. David said in Psalm 26, 8, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. If you go into work carrying a Bible and publishing thanksgiving and the works of the Lord... You can change the whole atmosphere. You can make your own home a house of the Lord, where His honor dwelleth by proclaiming His words in your house. In Psalm 26, 9, Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. Start speaking the words of God and watch the bloody men scatter. David says, In whose hands is mischief, and the right hand is full of bribes. We talked about those mischievous hands and their right hand is full of bribes because they try to make it appear righteous. You see, the right hand in the Bible is a positive thing. For example, Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father. The left hand is negative. For example, Jesus says to them, on the left hand, depart from me, you curse it into everlasting fire. I believe David says their right hand is full of bribes because they're trying to do it deceitfully. They're trying to make you think that they're peaceful and positive and they're for your good. You're, you're, they're manipulating you through their bribery. They're like, do this and we'll give you $100. Do this and you're a good person for doing it. They're manipulating you. Speak the word of the Lord and their bribery will be exposed as the manipulation trick that it is. If the evildoers can't get people to do what they say willingly... Then they will begin to try bribery. They'll f try to flatter you. They'll try to make you fear. Like you'll get sick and die if you don't do it. Uh, they'll guilt trip you. They'll say you don't love your family. You don't love your co-workers. You don't love your fellow man if you don't do this thing that we're trying to get you to do. And then the last thing they'll do is violence. To those people who they just can't get to do it eventually, it'll resort to violence or locking people up. Just like it'll be with the mark of the beast and the tribulation and worshiping the beast. If you don't worship the beast, you're going to be killed. And Psalm 26, 11 and 12, David says, But as for me, I will walk in my integrity, redeem me, and be merciful unto me. You see, those people with mischievous hands, they don't think they need to be redeemed. They don't think they need to be shown mercy by God. But God is being merciful to them just by letting them stay alive in their nonsense that they're doing. David says, My feet standeth in an even place, and the congregations will I bless the Lord. If you are standing on an even place, then you're not going to have to worry about sliding. Your foundation is Jesus Christ. He is a rock. He is a sturdy place to stand. Stay walking straight on the rock, and don't stray off on the sides where it gets slippery. So what are some ways to prevent backsliding? Consider sliding not to be an option. Don't even think, well, I'm going to slack off. Next thing, stretch yourself out on God's operating table. Lay yourself out there. Open the book and let the words just examine you. Give you a spiritual physical. Next thing, sit with the household of faith. Quit hanging out with people that's going to bring you down and make you backslide. Next thing, soak your hands in truth. Look at what your hands are doing from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. Are they involved in any mischief and wickedness? The next thing, speak of the Lord constantly. If you're talking about God from the time you get up until the time you go to bed, that's going to make it a lot harder to backslide. 
but this has just been some ways to prevent backsliding.